We're sitting down with the creators of The High Republic to take a deeper dive into the characters' worlds and mythology surrounding the Great Disaster. Plus, we're looking at how ILM X-Lab brought The High Republic to life in Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. And we're revealing some exclusive, never-before-seen information about the future of the series. We're 15 seconds from impact. Star Wars The High Republic Show starts right now. For a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were guardians of peace and justice. Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Star Wars The High Republic Show. I'm your host, Christina Ariel, and today we have so much cool stuff to talk about from all of the new stories and characters we've been introduced to this month, as well as taking a look at how all of it was created and how it ties into the Star Wars we all know and love. However, I gotta warn you, if you haven't read the books yet or you're thinking about getting into the story on your own time, don't worry, the show is still for you, but we are going to be talking about spoilers here. Tony, hit me with that graphic. So be warned if you want to go in completely cold. I mean, come on, it's the internet and Star Wars. We've got to talk about every single detail. But before we jump into the nitty gritty of the High Republic era, let's level set and take a look back at the overall Star Wars timeline. The Star Wars galaxy has existed for eons, but the majority of the stories we know and love are set within just a couple of decades that span from Episode 1, The Phantom Menace, to Episode 9, The Rise of Skywalker. The prequel era is known as the Fall of the Jedi and is the beginning of the Skywalker saga. This led to the reign of the Empire where the stories from the Bad Batch and Solo occur. The Age of Rebellion finds the stories from Rebels Rogue One in the original trilogy, leading to the New Republic and ending with the rise of the First Order and the later trilogy of films. And by the way, everything I just talked about is streaming right now exclusively on Disney+. Plus. But now that we know where we've been, let's go back in time hundreds of years in the past to a time Obi-Wan referred to in A New Hope. Hold on, let me channel miner. Obi-Wan. <clears throat> For over a thousand generations, the Jedi Knights were the guardians of peace and justice. The first round of stories from the High Republic era begin with an event known as the Great Disaster. A ship traveling through hyperspace is suddenly thrown from its course and ripped apart as debris careens towards the densely populated Hetzal system, threatening billions of lives. Luckily, the Jedi of the Republic, led by Jedi Master Avar Crisp, respond quickly and minimize the catastrophe. But why did this happen? Was it intentional? And if so, who was behind it? An investigation ensues as the Republic prepares for the dedication ceremony of the Starlight Beacon, a massive space station located in the Outer Rim intended to provide aid and hope for planets across the galaxy. It's kind of like an opposite Death Star, right? But that piece is threatened by a wicked band of marauders known as the Nile, bent on exploiting planets affected by the tragedy, potentially delaying the opening of the space station. Meanwhile, Jedi Knight Vernestra Rose ships with delegates is sabotaged on the way to the dedication ceremony. Those that survived are now marooned, discovering they're also being hunted by the Nile. Luckily, they're rescued by another Jedi Master, Skier, who has an interesting way of speaking. In between the chaos, Jedi Padawan Keith Trennis faces her Jedi trial, and despite abandoning them midway through, she ultimately proves herself and is knighted at the successful dedication ceremony of the Starlight Beacon. But as the celebration ensues, one Jedi by the name of Elzar Mann is struck with a frightening vision of the Jedi in great danger. What's the frightening vision? What does it mean? What's gonna happen next? Well, we're gonna have to wait and find out, but I can tell you personally, I can't wait. Star Wars is so much fun, y'all. There's something wrong with this place. They're gone. I don't feel any of them. No. Lost the temple is. My name is Sarah Barrick. I'm a production manager at ILMX Lab. Temple of Darkness is a roughly 15 minute experience inside of Star Wars Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. In the main experience, local bartender Cecil Slack will give you some tasks to complete. When you return those items to him, he will tell you a tale and transport you right into Temple of Darkness. Well, he was about to succumb to the darkness. My name is John Nguyen. I'm a lead designer for Tales from the Galaxy's Edge. Temple of Darkness tells the tale of Adi Sunzi, a young Jedi Padawan. Adi, along with her master Sylvan and other Jedi researchers, were out on an expedition to study ancient artifacts. During one of these expeditions, they accidentally unleashed a Sith relic that caused corruption to kind of spread through their minds. Adi was the lone survivor of that ordeal. Our story takes place right after that and kind of has to deal with what just transpired. Adi Sunzi is in the High Republic. She is generally described described as brash and headstrong, so she relies a lot on her force abilities and her skills with a lightsaber to get her through anything that she finds challenging. There's still darkness in me. 
feel it. And as Addie, as you go deeper, you'll sort of start entering a part of darkness. And this becomes her challenge as she travels deeper into the temple to try to assist Jedi Master Yoda. Focus, Padawan. Remember, you can. My name is Mario Orlando, and I'm a character animator at ILM X Lab. Having Frank Oz coming back to voice a character of Yoda was like a dream come true, especially for me. Frank was able to give us a lot of insight about Yoda, what motivates him, not only how he talks and moves, but what drives him. In essence, he told us that one word could define Yoda, and that's the world struggle. That's something that I kept in mind while animating Yoda. Using video reference was really valuable because it allowed us to pick up a lot of the nuances for the character, especially keeping continuity with the prequel movies and the classic trilogy. We noticed how much he emotes with his ear especially, and that's something that I really wanted to make sure I got right in the animation. The power to resist, to choose, the light, the essence of a Jedi, that is. At Island X Lab, we always love to surprise and delight. So when crafting the story, we really wanted to push the limits and the boundaries. We wanted to show that it took more than just jumping headfirst into a problem to solve any situation. And so it was fun to craft around that idea where you would normally want to face the situation in one way, but you really have to go against your own better judgment of the current situation to do the right choice. One thing that players can take away while playing Temple of Darkness is that you need to learn how to overcome your fears. And as a Jedi, you learn how to overcome it, which is a great lesson to take from them. The High Republic was a really exciting opportunity for us to write a story for. Because it's a relatively new area being explored inside of Star Wars, there was a lot of freedom and opportunity for us to contribute to this golden age of the High Republic and the whole impetus of exploration and discovery. If you're like me, you no doubt have lots of things to discuss with people about the higher public, whether it's the Nile, Trandoshan, and Wookiee Jedi, or even a lightsaber that can also double as a whip. The higher public is filled with all sorts of details that I personally cannot wait to dig into with my panel of guests. With me today are author of Light of the Jedi, Charles Soule, Justina Ireland, author of Test of Courage, and Lucasfilm Publishing's own Michael Seglain. Welcome, y'all. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Michael. This project is something you've been working on bringing into being since 2014. So what's it like to finally have these stories in the hands of Star Wars fans? Well, in terms of what it felt like, it was amazing. And then to see it resonate with people, you know, we've been getting fan art already. We've got two books on the Times bestseller list. It's truly surreal. That has to be a fantastic feeling, especially for you, Justina and Charles. You've been tasked at bringing the Jedi to life in a new way. What's it been like to explore this new era with the freedom to reimagine the Jedi in their timeline? And so, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot is the differences between writing this and writing other Star Wars stories. And usually with a Star Wars story, there's stuff that's storytelling that comes before you and immediately after you. And so in this case, nobody knows any of these characters. So not only are you creating brand new characters for people to meet, but you also are not beholden to like any kind of storytelling those characters have to be around for later. So that means Everyone is fair game. I agree completely. We literally have seen the moment Luke Skywalker was born and we've seen the moment Luke Skywalker died. And so when you use him in a story, there's only certain things you can do. But with Avar Chris or Vernesca Rowe or Buryaga the Wookiee Jedi, anything can happen with those characters. And it feels great to be writing those things and know that we have the advantage of surprise, but it also is conveyed to the readership in a way that we've, we've all been hearing repeatedly how this feels different. It feels cool, it feels new. And that's what we wanted to do from the beginning. So to hear it landing this well just feels great. So Charles, let's talk about Avar Chris, who comes in in this very epic, we're on the way style moment. You know, the first three chapters leading up to that moment are dark. You know, people you get to know, you like, you feel are people, and then they just bite it, spoilers. <laughs> and so then you get this moment where like, there, there's no way out. We're gonna lose everybody. And then one voice is able to say, we're here. And then the hope you feel, hopefully, is strong enough to be like, oh, wow, I cannot wait to see how they're going to get out of this one. I tried to write the absolute best introduction to the Jedi that I could, and I feel like this is a pretty decent version of that. So when dealing with something as far reaching as the legacy run explosion, there are consequences. And one of those is widespread grief and the thread of loss that that brings about. How much more difficult was it to write those characters and writing these introductory moments, knowing that those were actually their last moments? I have a rule of thumb when I'm writing anything. If I feel it, the reader's gonna feel it. And with Hedda Cassett, I definitely felt it. Like I was like, this is a person who 
has had a long storied career, who's done wonderful things, who really cares and tries. And she tries and she does her absolute best and it doesn't work. There's a lot of death in the High Republic so far. I mean, it happens in Justina's books. It's all over the place. You'll see, like, we are not shying away from the fact that things have consequences in the High Republic. But there's also a lot of people being saved and a lot of heroism and a lot of people saying, no, I will not allow that death to happen. And that's a pretty amazing thing. And Justina, to that end, with Emery, you see the anger that comes along with it and how easy it could be for that anger to introduce the dark side in the High Republic. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, maybe? <laughs> How was it to keep those stakes up for you? These are things that people actually go through in real life, right? Like people experience grief and people experience loss. And you know, it might not be a luxury liner exploding in space, but people are in car accidents and they lose their entire family. And so I think one of the things you have to do is you have to, when you're telling the story, you have to understand what that would be like for an, uh, an actual person. And so I think you have to really dig deep with that. You know, am I taking this emotional arc deep enough? What does it mean to a Jedi? I mean, a Jedi has to experience loss, but they also have to make sure it doesn't impact them in a way that makes them forget why they're in the galaxy and what their greater purpose is. All of us as people have had that moment where we can, we could be derailed by our anger. We could be derailed by our disgust or outrage. But the important thing is to recognize those emotions and then move on to the next thing. Okay, you're mad, so what are you gonna do to fix it? You know, how are we gonna change things? And I think that for kids especially, who have an innate sense of justice, kids are really good about what's fair and what's not fair. Those moments are even stronger. So yeah, so like, you know, we, we dig into grief, we dig into loss, we dig into those hard moments for kids because kids experience those moments and it would be a disrespect to their emotional journey if we didn't. Now with the Nile and the character of Markeon Rowe, I found myself feeling sympathetic towards Markeon Rowe as he had this great power thrust upon him and you're kind of seeing him come into his own. So what's it like to write a character that is the bad guy, but you also are invested in their journey? One of the things that I really wanted to do with Markeon Rowe was to create a villain that could stand up alongside Darth Vader Kylo Ren, Palpatine, Darth Maul, but also it had to be different and fresh. Couldn't just be a retread of those people. And one of the ways to do that was to show Mark Monroe overcoming a challenge that was all but insurmountable. And so by seeing him do this thing and the way that he does it with the ruthlessness and intelligence and kind of scary cunning, cements him as a very, very dangerous operator who will be able to stand up to both the Republic and the Jedi in the High Republic stories to come. And he has a lot of story to tell yet. It's This is really just the beginning for him and the Nile. So all of our stories converge at the dedication of the Starlight Beacon. Justina, do you want to give us a little bit about the significance of the Starlight Beacon? I mean, this is the beacon of hope. In literature, we always talk about endowed objects. So I'm going to give you a bit of it, like a little, like a nerd answer. An endowed object is an object that means more than the sum of its parts. And so when we talk about Starlight Beacon, we have to remember that it's not just a functional place, but it's also that endowed object where we see the height of the Jedi, not just through their workings with the Republic, but also through the storytelling that happens on Starlight Beacon. And another thing with the Starlight Beacon is this is where we see the kind of the convergence of the multiple storylines. We've seen Skier show up in Light of the Jedi, in the comic, in the young adult novel. So, it is kind of this central point for the story, and it is our beacon of hope. Yeah, it's definitely one of the, the linchpin story moments for us. The great disaster is one, right? It is this horrible disaster that happens in space that has these lasting effects. Dedication of Starlight is another. This is where we can have characters cross over from format to format. And, and even to what Justina was saying, you know, it isn't quite that lived in look that we've uh, come to expect with Star Wars. It is a little bit newer, a little bit brighter, a little bit shinier. It does have a little bit of that classic Grease at a type because we are looking at this as a galactic renaissance, right? This is the, the Jedi at their height. And the painting behind you of Lena So and her two friends, Matari and Voru, is a piece of art that was originally done by the absolute legend in Star Wars, Ian McCaig, who designed Darth Maul, among many other beautiful concepts. And we didn't know when he did that design that that was going to be Lena So, but we, we were able to see it from within the landscape of designs that he did. And we were like, that is perfect for the kind of character we're building. Any good ideas in play, which is a very exciting thing because there's a lot of good ideas when you get a group like this together. Speaking of, to bounce those ideas off one another when you're doing a crossover of these 
of this magnitude. How often were those calls and texts going back and forth about just crossing over these storylines? Every day. <laughs> yeah, so like it was extremely collaborative. I. I think like I've touched on this uh, before, but it's worth mentioning that usually when you write, it's such a solitary activity. But in this case, you're in the trenches and you have a buddy to your left and you have a buddy to your right and you're gonna say, hey, how are you seeing this? And like, you can go back and forth and bounce off little ideas. And so it doesn't necessarily impact the overall story arc, but it definitely makes the individual storytelling much richer. What were the challenges of the collaborative process of being all a part of this story and knowing was there any resistance in the force of writing these <laughs> these stories we're, look we're, so so there's five writers there's the wonderful brilliant lucasfilm story group there's you know editorial mike siglain jen Haddle, and that's a lot of opinions and a lot of different points of view on exactly what star wars is i think we all share a general sense of the things that are right and true about star wars but then like when you get down to the really teeny tiny pieces, there can be some discussion. A big motto that Chancellor So has in Light of the Jedi is we are all the Republic. And the idea is that, you know, we're all part of the same shared thing and we're all building it together. And even though we might not always see directly eye to eye on some of these issues, let's talk it out. Let's find a compromise so everybody gets something. And I think that's how we approach the development of the High Republic, where people definitely had ideas that were neg. You know, it's just part of the process. But I do not feel like it was ever competitive. It was always collaborative, even within the tension. One of the most rewarding things about it is how each of the authors are constantly trying to better the story, right? Because that's, that's what it's all about. And that's been just amazing to, to see. Again, we've been living with this story for two years, building everything from the ground up. So in Light of the Jedi, Avar Chris hears the Force as a song. If the Force could present itself to any of you, how would you receive it? I've always thought of the Force as sort of a nighttime sky full of stars, where each person is their own little light. Some lights might be brighter than others, but they, they're all important, right? They're all important because without that light, the, the sky wouldn't look the way it's supposed to. And Charles, how does it present itself to you? As a story, and if you think about it, every living thing has a story, right? The birth to death and, and regeneration into whatever new form they take. And that feels very much like the force to me. And all of the stories that are being told by just our lives being existing, all of those are stories and, and they're all part of the same story, which I think is beautiful, um, particularly as a writer. And Michael? Honestly, it would be art, like a time-lapse video of art that is ever evolving and never ending. I want to say thank you again to Justina Ireland, Charles Soul, and Michael Seglane. Thank you so much for being a part of the first ever Star Wars The High Republic Show Roundtable. And I look forward to talking with you again soon. Centuries before the rise of the Empire, prosperity, pioneering, and adventure marked the era of the High Republic. Bel Zetifar is the dependable apprentice to Jedi Master Loden Greatstorm. Determined to prove himself, Bell would follow his master anywhere. Despite Greatstorm's unconventional teaching style, Bell sees the Force as a flaming light. When he focuses, that light is sometimes no brighter than embers, but other times it burns with the strength of an inferno. Billions living in the Hetzel system are in danger after a catastrophic hyperspace disaster hurdles projectiles towards them. Bell and Master Great Storm are sent to Hetzel Prime to aid the planet's evacuation. And while Bell trusts in force, the two Jedi have only 80 minutes until impact. The Jedi of the High Republic are luminous, instilling hope, bringing peace, and protecting life even in the furthest reaches of the galaxy. And if you like that animated bio for Bell Zetafar, you will want to check out our YouTube channel where we'll have even more episodes of characters of Star Wars The High Republic popping up all the time. And speaking of our YouTube channel, no doubt you caught my cameo on This Week in Star Wars when I asked you for your questions about The High Republic using the hashtag THRSQuestions. And boy did you deliver! Luckily I've got Lucasfilm's Emily Scucani here to get some answers. Hi Emily, thanks for joining us today. Hey Christina. Well I have a couple of questions for you that were sent in to us on social and I think you might be the right person for answers. So the first one comes from 
Gear Madness, and they ask, in the amazing light of the Jedi, what's happening on Elfrona is told concurrently with the rest of the book, but Elfrona spans hours rather than the weeks that pass elsewhere. Is there an explanation I'm missing? I don't think you're missing anything. It's definitely intentional the way that the chapters have been placed the way that they are. We wanted the readers to keep in mind that Bell and Loden's storyline were happening throughout the book rather than just placing it at the very end. By spacing it out, it just kept the audience interested in their story. Readers are there throughout the whole thing, constantly wondering, you know, what's been happening? How is this going to tie in? And then it pays off in the end. So the next one I have here is from Ty Pilot Dandy, and they want to know, are Jedi considered more common in this era? Even thousands of Jedi in a galaxy of trillions doesn't seem like many. Does the average person know much about them? I think the average being does know about them. I think that they're more common than they ever have been in future eras. They're more spread out throughout the galaxy. So in the High Republic, you'll see them in outposts and Jedi temples that are further than just in the galactic core. In the prequel era, we just see them on Coruscant, and that's basically their reach, is the core of the galaxy, but in the High Republic, they're further and further out, reaching all the way out to the Outer Rim, trying to shine the light of the Jedi <laughs> as far as they can into the darkest corners of the galaxy. I like what you did there with that light of the Jedi pun. Well played. Thank you so much for being here, Emily. No problem. Thanks for having me. And remember, if you have a question you want us to answer here on the High Republic show, send them to us using the hashtag THR questions and maybe you'll get an answer on our next episode in March. And remember, there's a ton of new High Republic content coming at you in the days and weeks. Claudia Gray's new book, Into the Dark, comes out on February 2nd, following the adventures of book smart Padawan Reed Silas, exploring an abandoned space station with a charming rogue pilot classic Star Wars. Then, Marvel's The High Republic number two, written by Kevin Scott, continues the story of Avar Keeves Skier and the twins investigating a Nile attack while stumbling on the corpse of a hut. Oh, and Skier? Yeah, he starts to go berserk. You'll want to find out if he's starting to slip over to the dark side. Plus, there's a brand new series from IDW Comics written by Daniel Jose Older entitled Star Wars The High Republic Adventures, debuting February 3rd, which has Yoda and a Jedi Master with the nickname Buckets of Blood. Need we say more? Additionally, the ongoing short stories in Star Wars Insider will continue with the conclusion of Charles Soule's Starlight in Star Wars Insider number 200 in February, and a new story, First Duty by Kevin Scott in the March issue. Now before we go, I promised you some new reveals, and I have them. As most of you know, Claudia Gray's new book, Into the Dark, comes out next week. Well, we're able to exclusively reveal to you a brand new character, Wayseeker Jedi Orla Jereni. As a Wayseeker, Orla goes where the Force leads her, so she's not tethered to one specific location. In the book, we see her flashback to her time as a Padawan, as well as follow her journey as a Jedi Knight. Plus, her lightsaber is double-bladed and hinged, with the blades emitting out parallel, kind of like Dark Ray's saber in The Rise of Skywalker. But wait, there's more! We have your first look at Phil Noto's cover for Marvel Star Wars The High Republic No. 5, written by Kevin Scott. On the cover, we see Keeve clutching Skier, who looks like he's seen better days. Marvel Star Wars The High Republic No. 5 hits store shelves on May 5th. Finally, you may have already seen the cover for Justina Ireland and Shima Shinya's upcoming manga, The Edge of Balance. Well, we're very excited to exclusively reveal the name of the protagonist. The story follows Lily Tora Asi living on a serene remote Jedi outpost. That is, until the Drangir arrive and they're hungry for Jedi. Plus, Stellan Geos will also appear in the manga as well as another Wookiee Jedi known as Arkoff. High Republic. Great time for Wookiee Jedi, am I right? Star Wars The High Republic The Edge of Balance will be available on June 8th. And for more on these announcements and for continuing coverage of Star Wars The High Republic, you can always check StarWars.com slash The High Republic. I want to thank everyone for watching the very first episode of Star Wars The High Republic show. Remember to like the video, subscribe to the channel, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'm Christina Ariel, and I'll see you next time. May the Force be with you.